This movement that started to support Stephen and to fight Chevron in all their disgusting machinations by hiring these two appalling federal judges in this building here, Kaplan and Prescott, they, okay, they, have, they are going to find their match. And their match is in Stephen Donziger, but it's also in the rest of us. Yeah, we're, yeah. The rest of us will stand shoulder to shoulder. We're not going anywhere. If you want to fight on the ice, here we are. We're all putting our skates on, as they said in court today. Okay, that was Roger Waters um, from uh, outside the courtroom after Steve Donziger received a draconian six month sentence uh, for doing good things for people. Uh, there was nothing there. And, uh, and then the third man uh, by uh, the great uh, Anton Karras. Uh, I'm Randy Critical, Randy Critical Live on the Fly. Uh, we are being joined right now by Steve Donziger. I wasn't there, Steve, I saw you in the beginning. I was a little hopeful. Uh, you were not. You, I don't think you were that optimistic going in there because you've been through this process for the last eight years. Am I correct? Yes. I mean, you know, I, I've known for a long time the purpose of the exercise is not to dispense justice. It's to use the justice system as a weapon to criminalize an advocate for his successful advocacy in this case against Chevron, that being advocate being me. So I was not optimistic at all. I mean, you know, look, you always maintain some faint hope that a judge will do his or her duty properly. And I think, you know, 99% of judges in our federal system would have, they would have probably let me go home. I mean, after over two years of house arrest and a misdemeanor, which is utterly unprecedented for our country, but not these judges, you know, not Judge Preska or Judge Kaplan who are really ideologically driven activist judges who were trying to use their power to send a message that to the whole environmental movement, which is to not mess with big oil. So I, I didn't expect too much and I got the maximum sentence she could give and I wasn't surprised. Well, you've already served that. Nils Melzer talks about that. I mean, you've, you've already served 700, almost uh, 800 days. I mean, the, the sentence of six months you've done four times already. So that's what baffles so many people. Why wouldn't it be retroactive? Again, it's a trick, tricked up part of our justice system. I mean, obviously I've served my time many times over, um, but there's a technical rule, judge driven, that home detention doesn't count as detention. As a matter of fact, in the eyes of the law, according to Judge Preska, home detention where I'm under house arrest 24 seven with an ankle bracelet, I'm actually free in her eyes, free with restrictions, but I'm free. So she's not counting these you know, two plus years I've served on a misdemeanor at home when the maximum sentence for my offense level, and I, I assert my innocence, by the way, I did nothing wrong. And I believe this will be overturned on appeal. But the maximum sentence, even assuming I'm guilty, is six months in prison. So I've served four times that amount. And by the way, lawyers, there's no lawyer in New York history who's ever served more than 90 days in, 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 for this offense. And that lawyer, Bruce Cutler, served it at home. So, you know, I've served over eight times the length of the longest sentence ever imposed for this level of offense on a lawyer convicted of this charge in New York. I, I can't even call it Kafka-esque, it's beyond Kafka-esque. Now you're out still. Uh, she probably- was Well, I'm going, not out. I'm still under house arrest. I know that, but I'm saying that you're not- I'm in, not in prison, that is correct. So she could have remanded you to prison at that moment. What uh, changed her mind on that? And uh, what's in store? What can we see here from this point? So what's happening now is we're, the battle is now shifted to whether I can remain out under house arrest, 
pending the resolution of my appeal. And this is a very important issue. And I want people to understand that. Appeals in the federal system can take one to two years. What Judge Preska is trying to do, and again, I think this is entirely inappropriate and unethical, but it betrays what her real motivation is. What she's trying to do is force me into prison. So I serve my entire six month sentence now before my appeal can be resolved, which essentially means if I win my appeal, I will have served the full sentence for a crime I did not, that in the eyes of the law, I did not commit. So it's, it's really inappropriate. I mean, I, we can't find one example of someone convicted of a misdemeanor, given a prison sentence, who wasn't allowed to stay out of prison pending resolution of his or her appeal, other than me. She's trying to force me into prison. Now, we've appealed her denial of my motion to keep me out. And that's the first appeal that will be decided relatively quickly, probably within a month, by the Second Circuit Court of Appeals, the Federal Appellate Court here in New York, whether I can stay out pending resolution of my appeal. But the out, again, is house arrest with an ankle brace. It's the same conditions I'm in now. So if that plays out, you know, and the appeal takes one to two years, I will have served well over three years by that point on house arrest. And if I win my appeal, you know, it's three years for nothing. And even then it's, it, by that time, it'll be, you know, six times longer than the longest sentence. And if I lose my appeal after the three years, she could still force me into prison at that point for another six months. Wow, this is uh, really unbelievable. Uh, this is going to take, it, it, I, I foresee a lot of work and um, I wanna get this out before I ask any more questions. Obviously uh, they got uh, unlimited money, uh, whether it be the judge or Chevron to pursue getting you behind jail uh, bars. Uh, you, on the other hand, don't. So can, w people can still uh, donate to your defense fund because you need it now more oh, than God, do I need it. Yes. So if you can help, look, you know, they're trying to crush me in every way, shape and form, including financially. I have to pay lawyers. We have expenses and I can't work and I haven't earned an income in two years. We have a defense fund. It's administered by a highly reputable law firm in Seattle, Friedman Rubin. Go to the website, freedonziger.com. It has all the information, has a ton of more information about the case, articles and the like. And you can press donate and give whatever you can. I mean, give a dollar, five bucks, 10 bucks. You know, our whole fundraising model is about a large volume of donations to keep this thing going. And we need help. So again, go to freedonziger.com, give. If you can't give, don't worry about it. Go anyway, get the articles, and sign up, sign the petition so we can get your name and continue to send you updates about the case. Well, I, I urge people to donate, as you said, whether it be $5, if, if uh, 100,000 people put in $5 a piece, it'd be $500,000. So please folks, go to freedonziger.com uh, and, um, I, I got to tell you what really baffles me here is that the New York state delegation or the congressional delegation has not come out in your support. And I'm talking about people like Nidia Velasquez has not come out. Hakeem Jeffries has not come out. And of course, Gerald Nadler hasn't come out. Uh, Adriano Espayat has not come out. Now, these people call themselves progressive Democrats. Where are they? Good question. I mean, The Intercept just did a great story about this, Andrew Fishman. I urge people to read it. Um, what's interesting is my congressman in the U.S. Congress, Jerry Nadler, not only has not come out in support of me, he's ignored constant pleas for him to at least pick up the phone and call me or come visit me in my, in my, you know, my, my home where I'm under house arrest. We later found out his son works for Chevron at the law firm Gibson Dunn and Crutcher, which has been paid by Chevron literally hundreds of millions of dollars over 10 years to attack and try to demonize me. Jerry Nadler's conflicted and he has shown no courage. Kirsten Gillibrand, we found out, has taken over $450,000 in donations from the Gibson Dunn, Chevron's Gibson Dunn law firm over the years. And Schumer, my other senator, has taken over a million dollars from big law you know, from big firms that represent fossil fuel interests. They've been totally silent, you know? And like, these are my representatives. And these are people who can easily condemn human rights violations against lawyers in other countries, in Turkey and Saudi Arabia, Russia. You know, well, 
you know, Nadler has a constituent who I think is suffering from a massive human rights violation on U.S. soil. He's been completely silent. It's disappointing for sure. Well, I urge people not only to donate to uh, Steve's defense fund at uh, freedonziger.com, but also um, I want people out there to uh, start rallying and, and, and uh, supporting those who might primary all those Democrats that are running for re-election in 2022, because they're not representing your interests. They are representing the interests of destroying the planet. They are supporting Chevron by not supporting Steve. So I, I believe that these people should be primaried. And I'll give you a list later, folks, of all of those Democrats. And it's all of them, every Democrat in the state delegation whether it be the House or the Senate. Uh, and they can't say, well, this is not a New York issue because it is a New York issue. Tell us why, Steve, this is a New York issue. Well, it's a huge New York issue because there's a huge human rights problem happening right here in New York City and they're, they're not doing anything about it. And it's happening, it's orchestrated by Chevron and its law firms. It's being carried out by two federal judges. Let me be clear about what I mean here. The judge who charged me with criminal contempt, charged me because I didn't turn over my, I refused to turn over my computer and cell phone to Chevron to protect the privileges held by my clients in Ecuador who have spent 50 years suffering from poisons and toxic oil waste dumped by Chevron. Okay. Chevron wanted that my computer to figure out who these people were and to figure out our internal legal strategies, which is protected confidential information. So the judge who, who's a former tobacco lawyer, Lou Kaplan, who charged me, took his charges to the U.S. attorney, the SDNY here in New York. They turned down the case. Instead of dropping it, he appointed a private law firm to prosecute me. Private law firm, Seward and Kissel. Turns out, we found this out seven months later, has Chevron as a client. I'm being prosecuted by Chevron directly in a case rejected by the federal prosecutor. That's why a lot of people, including, by the way, six congresspersons, including AOC and Jim McGovern, Jamie Raskin, Rashida Tlaib, Jamal Bowman, and Cori Bush, have demanded Merrick Garland, our attorney general, intervene and take back this bizarre and what we believe is a completely illegal private prosecution and prosecute me directly. I'm probably the only lawyer in American history begging the Department of Justice to prosecute me because right now I'm being prosecuted by Chevron. They won't negotiate a plea. They, they are trying to pound me. They, they forced me into detention when not a single lawyer spent even one day in pretrial detention on a misdemeanor. And I've spent, a, I spent over two years by the time of my trial. So th this is a damn outrage. And I think that, you know, Merrick Garland, Joe Biden, Kamala Harris, Nadler, Schumer, Gillibrand, they need to step up or this corporate playbook is going to continue to happen as a way to attack activists, attack frontline defenders, attack earth protectors, and undermine our democracy, which is exactly what is happening through my case. Right. Well, you, you know, you mentioned uh, Jim McGovern. Now, right after uh, she sentenced you uh, to uh, six months in prison, uh, he was the only one that I saw. No one from my state of New York, your state of New York, came out, but it took a congressman from Massachusetts by the name of Jim McGovern. Here's what he said. He says in a tweet, this is not justice. It's the executives at Chevron who polluted Campesino communities, put lives at risk in Ecuador, and then dodged responsibility. Who should be behind bars? That's Jim McGovern. I'd like to see one of my congressmen or women come out and say the same thing. Wouldn't you? Of course. I mean, Jim is from Massachusetts. He's not from New York. So, you know, but Jim is a man who's, who's, you know, has a history of speaking truth to power. He's very active on so many important issues, including hunger in America, justice in Central America. Um, and he cares about this issue, as he should, as they all should. So, you know, Merrick Garland, by the way, blew off the, six, the letter from the sixth Congress. He just blew it off, didn't respond. That's an outrage. I mean, sir, talking about Merrick Garland, I mean, your job is to uphold the rule of law in the United States. How do you let 
a private oil company directly prosecute a lawyer and have him locked up. I mean, come on, man, take the case back and take it out of the hands of Chevron, put it in the hands of professionals, review it, assess it. If you think there's a case, let's talk. But if there's not, dismiss the charges and release me so I can continue my human rights work on behalf of the indigenous peoples of Ecuador who won a $9.5 billion judgment against Chevron that Chevron still refuses to pay. It's a pivotal case, folks. If you care about the environment, if you care about justice, uh, please go to freedonziger.com. Free Donziger, uh, D-O-N-Z-I-G-E-R.com. Uh, Free Donziger. Dot com. Uh, just, uh, Steve, we, uh, we, we're going to be going to um, Zurich to uh, talk to um, Niels Melzer, the special rapporteur on torture, to explain the ruling that came out or the opinion that came out or the finding that came out by uh, the UN uh, Working Group on Arbitrary Detention. They came out very strongly. And folks, I want you to stay tuned for that. And then we'll have Roger Waters on uh, after Niels. Uh, any last closing statement you'd like to make, Steve, before we go to Please, please remember the people of Ecuador. I mean, there many have died of cancer because of Chevron's oil waste. This was not an accident, by the way, in the Amazon of Ecuador. It was done deliberately to save money. They chose to dump billions of gallons of toxic waste as a cost-saving measure. They poisoned the rivers and streams that people rely on for the drinking water. Um, as I said, many have died. Um, that's what this is about. I'm being attacked to attack those people. I'm like a surrogate because they think by attacking me, they won't have to pay the people they poison. So we're connected. And just remember that this case is really about the crime Chevron committed in Ecuador. It's not about Steven Donziger, even though they're trying to make it only about me. So just please remember the people of Ecuador. Um, and if you can go to freedonziger.com and help us out by donating to the defense fund and getting involved in this campaign. Which, by the way, Randy, we already have 25,000 people signed up around the world. Well, I, I, I'm signed up. Uh, so uh, do that, folks, please. This is so critical. Uh, thank you, Steve. Uh, we're going to uh, play, uh, take a quick break and come back uh, with the special rapporteur on torture at the UN, Niels Melzer. Stick around. And then later, uh, Roger Waters. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Okay, uh, we're back. I'm Randy Critical, Randy Critical Live on the Fly here, and uh, we are going to Zurich right now, or somewhere in uh, Switzerland, uh, being joined by phone uh, by uh, Nils Melzer, the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture. Uh, welcome uh, to uh, the show again, I think two weeks in a row, uh, Mr. Melzer, Dr. Melzer. Just call me Nils. Okay, I'll just call you Nils. I, yeah, I've gotten to know you that well. Uh, Nils, um, we were talking in the uh, first segment with uh, Steve about uh, just on Friday, the uh, UN Working Group on uh, Arbitrary Detention came out with, I don't know if it's a statement or a finding. Uh, can you tell us what it was and the significance and what it implies? Yeah, maybe briefly, you know, obviously I'm not part of that working group, but, you know, as, as it's the weekend and, you know, you couldn't get a hold of them, I can perhaps... So I, can, I cannot speak on behalf of the group, but I can right. speak on behalf of the system because I am the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture. And by in, in terms of status, uh, it is very comparable. Uh, we're all independent UN experts. We're all appointed by uh, the UN Human Rights Council in Geneva, which is a group of 47 states on a rotating basis. Uh, the U.S. has been a member in the past and is today um, an observer, has returned to the Human Rights Council uh, early this uh, year uh, after uh, uh, under the Trump administration. They had left the Human Rights Council. But in February, the Biden administration has recommitted to that council. That's important because states that are committed uh, as observers or as members uh, are uh, 
you know, politically obliged, not legally, it's not a treaty obligation, but politically um, bound basically by the systems and procedures established by the council. And so uh, all of this is important because the working group on arbitrary detention, just as my own mandate as the special rapporteur on torture are human rights mechanisms that have been established by all of those states together uh, in order to report to states whenever they have allegations on uh, violations of human rights. And the, the point of this procedure is to draw the attention of governments to possible violations uh, of human rights under their jurisdiction and to get them to take uh, uh, countermeasures to you know, remedy that situation. And so how that works is that those experts, in this case, uh, the working group on RBD detention, uh, receives allegations uh, from their sources and then you know, obviously they, they, they make sure that these are, you know, credible allegations and then transmit those to the government and request the, the government to take position on that. Uh, and that's what has happened in this case. Uh, the U.S. has not responded at all to Wait, wait a second, Nils, I, Nils, I want to stop you there. Who, who sure. um, just one point, uh, yeah. somebody goes to them uh, the plaintiff in this case, would it be Steve Donziger or somebody else that would, would uh, show them something? H how does it initiate? Yes, it can be. It, can, it could be Donziger in this case, but it could also be a, a human rights organization. Uh, uh, it can be, you know, civil society organization. It can be anybody actually that has reliable information on human rights uh, uh, violations. It could be witnesses, uh, you know, uh, anybody actually that even other states if they have received reliable information that can so that's a very informal uh, procedure and, and the point is also that these allegations that are being transmitted are not necessarily already an established fact they are allegations and in states are then invited to respond to those allegations uh, you know perhaps correct them provide evidence um, and and on that basis then uh, you know, a, a certain conclusion could be found. Um, and in this case, <clears throat> this information has been brought to the attention of the working group um, and they have transmitted their concerns that the uh, detention, the, the home confinement of Stephen Donziger for, uh, uh, I think, more than two years now, uh, that that violates uh, the prohibition on arbitrary detention. Uh, and uh, they, they say that on the basis, as I understand, that the, uh, um, that, first of all, pre-trial detention is an exceptional measure that can only be taken when there is a real flight risk and, uh, uh, and, or a, you know, a danger uh, could emanate from a suspect in a criminal case if he's not being physically uh, you know, secured in, in custody. Now, in his case, there really is no basis um, uh, to uh, order a pretrial detention because uh, clearly he's never been violent and there is, you know, not even the, the court ever claimed that there would be a physical a risk or a threat emanating from Danziger. So the only risk that they um, uh, raised or <clears throat> claimed existed was a flight risk. Now, he had showed, he had never missed a, um, a court meeting. He had, uh, you know, he lives in New York City, you know, for more than 14 years with a wife and a son. Uh, that's, you know, there's no, there is no reasonable, it's not plausible to think that he would abscond if from a criminal proceeding where the maximum punishment is six months of confinement. And he has actually already spent four times as much in confinement now uh, which again is a clear violation of, of you know, the principle of proportionality. Um, so all of this to say, the concerns that were raised by the, uh, the, the, the working group were that, well, first of all, there seems to be a clear bias on, um, and I'm, I'm now citing, you know, referring to what, what they have found. I have not investigated the case myself but I'm just recounting it, that uh, they found the, a clear bias on part of the involved judges um, uh, where they have you know, circumvented basically uh, e even procedures to appoint judges uh, um, uh, that are impartial. 
think it tried to make sure that the case arrives with judges that would decide as was desired in this case by Chevron. Um, and there seem to be strong indications uh, in, in that direction uh, that uh, Stephen Danziger has been abusively basically uh, being confined uh, in, in house arrest because there is no need, there's no necessity to do that. And because uh, according to human rights law, um, when pretrial detention exceeds the maximum duration of a possible prison uh, uh, sentence, then in fact, the, the sentence has already been served uh, despite the fact that he, there has been no conviction. And uh, the Human Rights Committee has repeatedly said that in such cases, he, you know, the, the defendant simply has to be uh, released. It becomes disproportionate and excessive to use these types of, of, of measures. So that was also one of the concerns they had. And, um, and, and then one very important concern is that they said they had a strong impression that uh, this proceeding was being used and the confinement was being used as a reprisal against Donzinger, uh, who has, uh, you know, and this is important to underline, his, he, he, the, the reason he is involved in all of this is because he, uh, he acted as a human rights defender, as an attorney of the indigenous people of Ecuador, who had suffered incredibly under, you know, decades of pollution uh, caused by uh, by Chevron, and there seems to be abundant evidence uh, for that pollution and you know the the, the, the accompanying risks, and so that it, it seems to be that uh, that this proceeding uh, should serve as a deterrent and as a reprisal against a human rights defender, which in itself obviously is a uh, human rights violation, and so <clears throat> this is really kind of the, the gist of of that uh, opinion. It is not a judgment because the, the working group is not a court, it's not a judicial instrument, it's a mechanism, uh, as I you know, uh, just explained before, that was established by the states, uh, you know, you know, and mandated to uh, report these types of allegations to them. So, uh, you know, states cannot in good faith then not engage with the mechanisms they have, uh, you know, that they have uh, established themselves, which unfortunately in this case has happened um, with the, the US government. Uh, perhaps I can just say that I've made the same experience with the US in my intervention with the, uh, in the case of Julian Assange, that uh, I received a very short response and then the US government basically refused to engage, but that was under the Trump administration. And so there was great hope when President Biden declared in February this year that the US would re-engage with the Human Rights Council um, that as an observer, um, that this would change uh, because he, he said, and, and here I, I basically quote from, from the press statement um, by uh, uh, Secretary of State Blinken, where he said that the Human Rights Council can serve as an important forum for those fighting injustice and tyranny. And here we clearly have indigenous people fighting for justice for decades of grave abuse. Um, and then he goes on this press statement by Blinken to say that the council can help to promote fundamental freedoms around the globe, including fundamental rights of marginalized communities, including obviously this would be the indigenous people and that the US must be at the table using the full weight of our diplomatic leadership, it says. So all of this would suggest that, that the, uh, the US uh, uh, claims a leadership position in human rights. And this is simply incompatible with uh, their refusal to engage with the working group on arbitrary detention uh, uh, in this case, and, and also with, with, with similar mechanisms in other cases. Well, well you, you, you made a good point. Uh, you made a lot of good points. But early on, you were talking about he has spent more time than the uh, six months that he received, which is the maximum. Uh, 780 days, you know, if he had pled guilty the day he was charged, uh, he would have been out, uh, you know, uh, 600 days ago, 600 days ago. So he's really serving the six months on top of the uh, two and a half years, almost uh, a three year uh, prison sentence for something that carries uh, only uh, six months at most minus good time. Uh, now, what are the recommendations uh, 
by, by the working group on arbitrary detention in this case. Now, what are they recommending that they do? I think it's compensation and, and, and what else? Right. Well, the working group came to the conclusion that in this case, um, well, it regretted obviously, first of all, the, you know, the failure of the US government to engage uh, constructively with the, with the working group, well, to engage at all with it. And, and so they said, based on the evidence at their disposal, they came to the conclusion that in the case of, of Stephen Donsinger, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, as well as the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights had been uh, uh, repeatedly violated. And uh, this, particularly in terms of the prohibition on arbitrary detention, on a due process as well, very important, uh, and on the prohibition of discrimination. So these are kind of the three big, uh, you know, uh, human rights violations that have been spotted. And so the working group says that, and here I quote from the decision, the working group requests the government of the United States of America to take the, the steps necessary to remedy the situation of Mr. Stephen Donsinger without delay and bring it into conformity with the relevant international norms, including those set out in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. And then I, I, I continue in the quote one more sentence here, where it says, the working group considers that taking into account all the circumstances of the case, the appropriate remedy would be to release Mr. Stephen Donsinger immediately and accord him an enforceable right to compensation and other reparations in accordance with international law, end of quote. So this is what the working group has, has asked. And then it has also asked, actually, the third thing it has asked is it urges the government to ensure a full and independent investigation of the circumstances surrounding the arbitrary deprivation of liberty of Mr. Stephen Nanziger. And that's very important because those due process violations seem not to be accidental, but the result of a, you know, of, of a pre-existing bias. If that is confirmed, that would actually be a case of judicial corruption, which clearly must be investigated to make sure that you know, this is being treated according to uh, the law. And so this is kind of the, 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 the core of, of, the, of the decision. And there's also a follow-up procedure where the, the working group asks both the sources that have submitted uh, evidence and the government of the United States to provide it within six months with information as to you know, how that follow-up uh, what follow-up measures have been taken to its recommendations, whether he has been released unconditionally, and if so, on what date, whether compensation or other reparations have been made to Mr. Stephen Donsinger, and whether an investigation has been conducted into the violation of his rights, and if so, the outcome of that investigation. So, and also finally, uh, you know, they also want to know whether uh, the, the US has uh, made any legislative uh, uh, amendments uh, or changes in practice um, uh, to harmonize its laws and practices with its own international obligations that it, you know that uh, are derived from the treaties that the U.S. have have ratified. So it's not you know a working group pulling this out of thin air, but they're really you know these are some of the most uh, established international experts, legal experts um, that have been appointed by the states. You know, so it's not uh, some NGO make, making some wild claims. And I'm not trying to belittle NGOs, they're extremely important, but you know, the governments can more easily distance themselves from claims made by NGOs than from claims made by mechanisms they themselves have, uh, have appointed. Uh, so so uh, uh, yeah, that, that is basically a bit the, the summary of, of, of this. Well, uh, thank you, Professor uh, uh, Melzer. Uh, my associate Kelly Lane uh, uh, pointed out earlier to me that uh, that the judge in this case called um, uh, this working group uh, connected to Stephen Donziger. Could, could you give me your thoughts on that in, in a minute or so? Well, I, I think that, you know, as far as I understand, uh, any reference to the United Nations was, was uh, avoided. Uh, but that is also something, you know, that we have seen in other countries, uh, in the United Kingdom, when the same working group decided that uh, Julian Assange's detention or confinement in the Ecuadorian embassy was a form of arbitrary detention because he was not able to leave the embassy without exposing himself to grave violations of, of, hu of his human rights. Um, you know, in, in the British parliament, um, 
there was basically uh, uh, claims were being made that well, this is just some are you know some some group of independent experts that have no you know uh, relevance whatsoever. Um, but that obviously happens only when the decisions and the opinions of that working group uh, you know are not consistent with the opinion of of the government, you know, what it would like to hear. Uh, whenever those decisions go in its favor, then, you know, these governments are always full of praise for the working group and say that these are the most highly esteemed UN experts, uh, you know. So it, clearly what we see here is a politicization of, of, the, uh, of, of, of these, uh, these mechanisms by the states, it kind of basically the pick and choose approach. Uh, we, we, we use them instrumentalize them when we like what they say and when we don't like what they say they they are simply independent experts that no one you know that we can simply ignore uh, that is unfortunately a bit the weakness of these mechanisms but that's not the fault of those experts because it's the states that have created those mechanisms precisely in that way so they can play this game uh, wow. it's just uh, the, the reality that is very familiar to to me as well in my own work well, uh, Professor Melzer, on short notice, I want to thank you. As you said, I, I needed somebody right away. To, I couldn't get through to anybody else as part of that working group. And I think you've cleared everything up here. And I, I wish you well um, and look forward to having you back on because you're always a great guest. And um, we'll talk to you soon. Uh, we're going to take a quick break and come back with um, the legendary um, composer and super activist Roger Waters, who's been involved in this case as an activist for many years. We'll be right back. Okay, we're back. I'm Randy Critical, Randy Critical Live on the Fly. Uh, and uh, the other day on uh, Friday, uh, I spoke to Steve earlier about this. I uh, was out in front at the rally uh, prior to the sentencing of uh, Mr. Donziger. And I uh, happened upon my next guest. And that, of course, is Roger Waters, who we talked about in, uh, earlier in, in the show. Uh, Roger Waters, uh, you know, I was hoping you would take my dog in inside uh, to bite the judge uh, because I couldn't go in. Uh, but it's great to have you back, uh, Roger. Uh, let me just ask you this to begin with. Um, what was your feeling going in there and then your feeling going out? Uh, oh, that fuck one? that. Let's get let's talk about the important things first. How is your little doggy? What a <laughs> sweet animal, really. <laughs> Yes, well, I tried to pawn her off on you, and you wouldn't take I her. I tried to buy her, and you said she couldn't be bought for any price. You can't be bribed, but... <clears> you know, I have to tell you, I'm going to talk to the audience for a minute, because Randy's dog is about that long, okay? And it's all covered in sort of nicotine-stained white stuff that was once fur, and she is absolutely gorgeous, and I fell in love with her, and... Um, Anyway, it's that time of night, so I'm going to have a, you know, I'm going to have a sip of wine, and then we can get on with the show. Chardonnay, or is it no Savion Blanc? It, it's uh, Louis Jadot Puy Fuisse. Wow, you it's, have that every year on Bastille Day, I believe. I have that every day on every day. Fuck oh, it, whether it's Bastille Day or not, because oh. that is my everyday, you know, cheap white wine. That's cheap white wine. All right. Uh, and that, let's not call it cheap. It, right. I've no idea how much it costs. Yeah. You know, this is one of the things about fading rock stars is they don't check the price of Louis Jadot, Puy Fuisse, or how much a pound of sugar costs or a bottle of milk or in it. I have no idea what things cost. But the people in Ecuador do, right? Yeah, they bloody well do. And that's why we're fighting this battle. Well, you've been at it for a, a long time. So um, I must ask you, uh, you've been at it from day one uh, when you met Steve, you've been to Ecuador and yeah. then this was the, um, this was the closing uh, segment of this um, 
this horrible drama. Uh, what yeah. was your sense? I saw you going in and that was I, it. Good. You've asked me the question again. Thank you. Because I'd forgotten what you asked. You so saw me I. go. It was unbelievable to be in there. It's very weird to be in a courtroom and know that the disgusting woman sitting on the bench has all the power. And that if you stand up in the courtroom and go, I'm not going to use the C word because it's not polite. And also you have, this is a television show and it's going out to people who might be sensitive to the C word, but you just want to stand up and go, you, I'm not going to use the F word, obviously. It's not as bad as the C word, but I'm not going to call you a, on, like, on live television. because. But she is such a disgusting piece of shit, that judge, that that's what you want to do. But I didn't. And nobody does. You can't. You're not allowed to. Well, you are, I think. I wanted to use the C word all day long. And I understand ah. the sentiment there. I mean, what am I supposed to say? She's a term again for Virago or, uh, you know, a winch. I don't know what to call her, but she's really a horrible human being, male. Yeah, or but you know what she is, Randy? She is a cog in the fucking wheel. She's irrelevant. She's a nobody. And she'll never be an anybody because she has absolved herself of her right to a walk on part in the war she is playing what she considers to be a lead role in her cage and the cage is the cage of being a federal judge you have to play the game if that's what you want to be and she is playing the game and the game is to sell out to the highest bidder and the highest bidder is the u.s government and or chevron corporation it wouldn't matter it could have been the Sackler family or people selling oxycodone and, you know, it could be anybody who's making money out of the rest of us. And that's what Loretta Prescott does for a living. She supports that uh, machine and she's a tiny cog. So we shouldn't get too upset about it because she's an irrelevant piece of shit on the sole of the shoes of people who care about love and human rights and progress and all of those things that I know you care about because you're my friend and I know you and Stephen Donziger cares about and I care about and Niels Meltzer cares about who's also on this program and they, they, so Loretta Preska is sort of irrelevant to us, except she wields extraordinary executive power because she's a federal judge. I've finished. Yeah, well, you know, well, the, you, you also said the other day something about Thomas Kaplan, uh, who uh, basically... Lewis. Lewis, I mean, did I say Lewis Thomas? Lewis A. Kaplan. Lewis H. Yeah. Kaplan. Uh, Thomas Kaplan writes for the Times. Uh, the fact that uh, she got the case from him. It was the whole thing was so choreographed. I haven't seen anything like this since uh, Oswald was shot. No, it's extraordinary. But the good thing is that people like the UN Commission on Human Rights are taking notice of it and going, whoa, this is weird. And it is. It's like it, it's um, it's not like a soap opera. It's like a pantomime. It's like a crazy pantomime so it's, it's very difficult to take it seriously except when you're in the courtroom and they're trying to send my friend Stephen Donziger who is an accomplished eloquent uh human rights advocate and they're trying and she this disgusting woman is trying to send him to prison on a trumped up contempt charge instigated by the other arsehole in this in this um drama who is lewis a kaplan who is the judge who hired her and 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 rita glavin they're the three they're the three main people that whenever they come on stage i would expect an audience of children to go boo 
because they're villains. They're absolute villains in this charade, and it is only a charade. I, I, I really, it, it is, it's beyond Kafka-esque. Uh, you got to come up with a good term. Uh, now, she was accepting, I don't know if she took them seriously, but people uh, sent her letters. And I think Steve uh, and his lawyers advocated sending letters to the judge, but I think she's impervious. I don't care who wrote or writes the letter. Uh, and I know that you wrote a letter, you read it the other day. I couldn't hear it all, but it got a lot of applause throughout. Did, uh, did you submit that letter to her? Absolutely not. Okay. As I explained before I started to read it, on in front of the courthouse on 500 Pearl Street, I didn't submit it because I knew what I knew it would go straight in the bin. And all the considered and careful uh, legal opinions that were sent to her explaining to her why what she was doing was so wrong and why this whole thing is such a waste of the taxpayer's money who are being asked to pay her and Rita Glavin, uh, the prosecuting counsel, millions of dollars uh, to preside over this charade. Why, why they're all, why, why, why it's as wrong as it is. So no, I didn't, but I did. I read it out and I've got it in front of me here, but I read it out in the street, even though you couldn't hear it. Well, um, I, there's no clean copy out there. So I, I would, if you would be so kind, could you read it for our audience? I'd be, I'd be delighted to. It's a bit long, but I'll read it as fast okay. as I can. I've got time for you. Okay. All right, cool. Okay. So... Shit. You know, I don't know if you remember, but I have to, I have to keep passing it to a child who was standing, another witness who was standing next to me to peel sheets off the top because I was a bit dry. All right, here we go. An open letter to Federal Judge Loretta Presker. Um, blah, blah, blah. Most letters start with the prefix, dear. This one doesn't. Judge Preska, if I may, I shall address you using the name your parents gave you. So, Loretta, where to start? First, an explanation of why there is no dear before your name. Well, I was in court recently when you presided over the so-called trial of Stephen Donziger, who was being privately, prose privately prosecuted at the behest of your colleague, Judge Lewis A. A. Kaplan on contempt of court charges. Your handling of the proceedings was execrable. Ooh, I love I that. Know, I'm not sure whether Loretta knows what the word execrable means, but she should look it up in a dictionary. Now I'm going to skip a lot because it's a very it's a long letter, and uh, and I don't think blah 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 blah. Oh, I, I did like this bit. I feel no warmth towards you. You are not dear to me. Uh, if some part of me feels something akin to sympathy for you, uh, which some part of me does, it is not in sympathy with any of your actions, which are, in my view, contemptible. No, what I feel is more akin to the dull, uncomfortable anguish one might experience in the presence of a deranged soul in torment <laughs> all right you get the you get the idea yes. you get it Michael. um i don't i'm not sure you need to hear I, I, the rest I, no go ahead please i'd like to hear really? a little more if possible okay are you beginning to get the picture loretta i mean i i was in court again you know yesterday the the day before i watched this woman she actually looks as if she's disintegrating and the way she behaved and the way she read out an an obviously preconceived um description of her reasons for sentencing donziger was um really hard to watch because it's such bullshit or all of it. You know, it's all based on the idea that Donziger is a gangster and that 
the $9.5 billion judgment that was found in Ecuador by an Ecuadorian court um, against Chevron for their pollution, um, the idea that it was fraudulently arrived at and that, in fact, Stephen Donziger himself somehow magically wrote the judgment that appears in the name of an Ecuadorian judge and has been upheld by appellate courts, nine of them, not just in Ecuador, but in other places as well. And so, um, so I, anyway, I'll, I'll, continue. I'll con continue with my letter. Good, all right, let's call a spade a spade. To, to connive in the way that you have with federal judge Lewis A. Kaplan and Chevron Corporation in their ill-conceived and dishonest attempts to demonize Stephen Donziger in order to facilitate Chevron Corporation's avoidance of its responsibilities in the matter of that company's refusal to comply with a thrice ratified court order to pay $9.5 billion in reparations for damage done to the indigenous people in the rainforests of Ecuador is despicable. Your actions and those, and then I list a bunch of other people, Mike Worth, CEO of Chevron, Randy Masto, lead advocate of Gibson Dunn, uh, Sudan Kissel, who were the law firm, uh, from which uh, Rita Glavin came, who's the prosecuting counsel. She's now left Sudan Kissel. Sudan Kissel, I think, figured out that she was actually problematic. And so was this law case. So they've now, they've distanced themselves from it. Um, anyway, unlike of all these people, all of these people, Stephen Don... Sorry, you were about to interrupt me then, quite rightly. Here we go, I'm listening. Okay. Unlike all of the above, um, Stephen Donziger and I and his advocates, Marty Garbus and Ron Kirby, and supporters like Susan Sarandon, who wasn't there yet. She wasn't there, actually, um, yesterday. But the only reason she wasn't there is because she was flying back from Georgia from another case that she's about. Anyway, it doesn't really matter. I know I'm, she may even have been acting. I don't know she was on another work of activism or advocacy, but knowing Susan, she probably was. She was either doing that or acting. Anyway, um, but, and 68, Nobel laureates and several thousand honest lawyers. I go on and on about all the people who support Stephen, who are real kind of human beings, who are not cogs in the corporate wheel, but are human beings who care about human rights and blah, blah, blah. I'm going to skip on blah, blah, blah. All of us, unlike all those named above, believe this truth. We all believe, Stephen Donziger believes this truth. So does Randy. Here we go. All our brothers and sisters all over the world, irrespective of the color of their skin or the depth of their pockets, deserve equal human rights under the law. All right. So uh, I say we've nailed the colors to the world. Sorry. Uh, and blah, 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 blah. The man in the street is no blind beggar, Loretta. He sees you trying to keep up the pretense sitting there on the bench, all supercilious and inviolate, reading your newspaper in open court, for God's sake, trying to keep up the pretense that what you do has something to do with justice, a pretense that would be sad beyond all belief if it were not so deeply obnoxious. No, Judge Preska, you are not dear to me. Uh, so where are we now? Where do we stand? You've arrived at your guilty verdict without... And then I try and persuade her that she should say uh, that Donziger should be freed, time served, as he's been in under house arrest for 787 days. And, and she, she, in her summing up in court later, after I'd read this letter, um, she dismissed all of that. She dismissed 
the hundreds of letters that she's got from people explaining that Donziger does not deserve to go to prison. And she sentenced him to six months imprisonment, which is the maximum that she was allowed to. You and were not she, surprised by that, were you? No, I wasn't surprised by it. I was, I was disgusted by it, but not surprised. The, the idea that the leopard Presca would suddenly change its spots, uh, it, you know, given that it has the opportunity. You know, do you think that Loretta Presca has actually looked at the at the case that um, Lewis A. Kaplan sat on the bench and gave judgment in that Steve Dunziger was a um, criminal fraudster who, who blah, 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 blah. No, of course she hasn't, because that case has completely fallen apart, even though the appeal that went to the Second Circuit was denied, his appeal. It was, in my view, wrongly... Um, argued and tried uh, on legal grounds rather than on, on the basis of the facts, because the facts were that the chief uh, and only uh, witness for the prosecution in that trial was a corrupt ex-Ecuadorian judge called Guerra, who had accepted $2 million from Chevron to lie to the court on their behalf which he has admitted since. So it's now a matter of public record that the guy who was paid $2 million by Chevron and also had his whole family brought from Ecuador and set up somewhere in some safe place, lied to the court in order to get the conviction decided upon by one man, Lewis A. Kaplan, a significant shareholder in Chevron Corporation. I mean, you couldn't write this shit. This no. is so yeah, I, it's obviously I, corrupt and despicable. Every angle of this entire affair reeks of corruption. <laughs> I mean, it does. Something so obvious and blatant in any case in my 67 years of life, not one that's this obvious, one yeah. that this execrable. Well, that's, that is why. Execrable again? Execrable. That is why Loretta Presca looked so haunted in the courtroom. She looked drawn, haunted, and she would look defeated if it wasn't for the fact that she can hide behind what I describe as the inviolate and supercilious nature of her position as the presiding judge. So nobody else in that courtroom has any power. She makes the decision on her own. And she's been told what the decision is. She knew it going into the case. She knew it every single second that we were in the courtroom when we were arguing the case, or Ron Kirby and Marty Garbus were. And she knew it today when she went in. She knew that she was going to sentence him to six months, as did we all. But she did it. And she did it in public, and she did it in the glare of the publicity that you, Randy, and Neil Smeltzer, and me, and those of us who support Stephen in his fight for the Ecuadorian rainforest dwellers who've been so disgustingly treated by Chevron, not by the judicial system. The judicial system found that they were deserving of 9.5 billion dollars in reparation for the damage that they suffered at the hands of Texaco. Wow. So this is so this is like them just going, no, fuck you. We're rich. We'll do whatever they want. Fuck the rainforest. Fuck indigenous people. Fuck all poor people. Fuck the working class. Fuck you all. We don't give a fuck about you. We're gonna have our way. And the courts. And this is the sick part. Will, the American jurisprudence will back us up because we bought them and paid for them and they are in our pockets. That's what this case shows.
Well, that was very well said. Uh, I, I got to tell you, we're out of timer. We got like a minute left. We're, we're going to go out with, uh, if you would just set this up, this is an excerpt uh, from uh, your uh, new masterpiece called The Bar. Can you just give us a one minute summation? This is just an excerpt. We played it before, uh, uh, what the uh, bar uh, is, what inspired it, and uh, we'll go out with that. Um. Yeah, it's a sort of longish song that maybe bookends to a new album of mine, I think, at some point. The bit I've sent you is the bit that talks a bit about Standing Rock and my, my friends uh, in the Native American community who made that heroic stand against the uh, DAPL pipeline there, among other things. So I won't say any more about it than that. But I promise you this, Randy, I'm going to send you another little clip because you've played this clip often. And the way you put the images of the Ecuadorian uh, indigenous people alongside lyrics that were basically written about Native American people in North and South Dakota is very moving to me. So thank you for doing well, that. Thank I'm Kelly pretty... Lane for that. Uh, she does all of the editing. And uh, we have to go now, Roger. Uh, okay, stay bro. Second. But uh, this is The Bar. We're going. I'm Randy Critical. Randy Critical live on the fly. Uh, the Bar by uh, Roger Waters. Thank you for everything that you do. Always. You've been there for Steve from the beginning. And for me, thank you very much. You kept this show alive. We're going. See you next week, folks. All right. Yeah, hope so. Does everybody in the ball feel shaky? Lord knows I do. I guess we all feel pretty much the same Kind of wore out by this crazy fucking soul The smell of napalm with the cornflakes The chafe of killing everything that breathes Imposing sanctions on the lady down the street. Till she takes the in and packs her bags and leaves. Come on in here, sister, and set us back. You are most welcome in the bar We may seem few, but we are many Have you been traveling for? The girl who brought you in here is Lakota from Standing Rock, where they made the stand. So from Fort Yates, North Dakota, here's a message for the man. Would you kindly get the fuck off our land?